Speaking of Faith from American Public Media is supported by the Pew Charitable Trusts. Investing in ideas, returning results. PewTrust.com. Additional support is provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the John Templeton Foundation. I'm Krista Tippett, and this is Speaking of Faith, conversation about belief, meaning, ethics, and ideas. Today, the power of fundamentalism. Violent religious fundamentalism is one of the great threats confronting the modern world. Fundamentalism has a different history and expression in every religious tradition. The dictionary defines it as a movement or attitude stressing strict adherence to a set of basic principles. But that does not begin to describe the power of this way of seeing the world, nor its potential to motivate and to destroy. This hour, we'll hear why some people became fundamentalist, what drew them out of it, and what we might learn from the fundamentalist impulse at this time. We'll speak with three men. They are Muslim, Christian, and Jewish, a lawyer, a seminary president, and a journalist. Each of them has remained deeply religious while redefining the foundations of their faith. When these men criticize fundamentalism, they're not describing someone else. They're speaking about themselves, their families of origin, their childhood friends. It's a form of intoxication, and I grew out of it, but in the case of these kids, and they are kids, most of them never live long enough to outgrow it. Their lives are tragically short and tragically delusional. When Khaled Abu El Fadl refers to these kids, he's also speaking of his own early years, a life he narrowly escaped. Today, he is a leading international authority in Islamic law and human rights with degrees from Yale and Princeton. He's a professor of law at UCLA. But he grew up in a middle-class family in Kuwait and Egypt, and he was a Muslim fundamentalist by the time he reached seventh grade. Khaled Abu al-Fadl compares the kinds of young people who join Muslim fundamentalist groups across the world with the kinds of young people who join gangs in cities in this country. The main difference is that in the Islamic context, you've got to add a civilizational component. Normally, you know, a kid coming from a certain area of L.A. who decides to join a gang, he's not thinking about changing the world. Even a Christian fundamentalist in the United States who joins a Christian group is not thinking in those terms. But those kids, they, they grow up with numerous mythologies about the greatness of the past, And they look at their present, and their present is remarkably miserable at many different fronts. Tell me how that was real and concrete for you. As an Egyptian, it becomes very concrete when you think everywhere you turn, the the identity to which you belong is confronted with military defeats. If you... A travel, you carry an Egyptian passport and you try to travel around the world, you've become thrown into a category of the inferior just by, by virtue of the fact that you belong to an Arab identity. And I remember, you know, going through a stage where I tried the, the sort of cool route of being westernized. That, for me, didn't work. And what did work was that that exaltation, intoxication, remarkable high of finding a group of people that tell you, you know what, you're better than the Americans, you're better than the British, you're better than the Arabs, you're better than the Turks, you're better than anyone because you're Muslim and all you have to do is just simply accept our version of orthodoxy. And I remember as a teenager, suddenly, I would walk around with my head high. I belong to something very powerful. And I could see the world as black and white, evil and good, and I was on the side, in fact, not on just on the side of good. Anyone who wants to achieve goodness has to come through me. Hmm. You know, they, they have to get... My approach. Right, that's the ultimate power. So right. um, that was the high. That's the intoxication. 
Fortunately, I grew out of it. Unfortunately, many of these kids never get that chance. I'm fighting for my lord. I'm chopping coppers up like Hollywood is double bladed sword. I lost my shield. Either I'm gonna live to see us win or I'm gonna die on the battlefield. And y'all all get slaughtered and be a martyr in jihad fighting for my God. I lost upon the word of Allah. A long way for is a war holler. Yo, it's time for jihad. A section of the song Jihad by the Muslim rappers, Soldiers of Allah. Khaled Abu El Fadl is quick to note that there are versions of Islamic fundamentalism which are not violent. They may condemn the beliefs of others, but they leave judgment up to God. He uses the word supremacist or Puritan to describe the militant Saudi Arabian Wahhabi brand of Islam to which he once adhered and which we now associate with Al Qaeda. Egyptian-born, Khaled Abu El Fadl is frequently called upon to analyze the theology of Islamic terrorism. And he cautions that social and political developments since the 1980s have left many young people in the Islamic world vulnerable to Wahhabi influence, whether they and their families are extremist or not. In this theology, truth is unequivocally identifiable. It is identifiable. It is identifiable. Not only is there a truth, but the, this truth is attainable on this earth. Furthermore, the perfection of God is attainable on this earth. Third is that discussion, discourse, philosophy, history, all of that is either an aberration or sophistry. And I learned very early on during this phase that philosophy is the science of the devil. The devil invented philosophy in order to lead people astray. Intellectuals exist basically to confuse people. History, other than the, hist other than the time period of the prophet and his companions, which is highly idealized. The rest of history is basically an aberration. And, and so this identifiable truth is located then in a literal reading of the Quran? Well, that's what you're taught. I mean, that's what you are taught. And of course, you know, most of these kids, the honest truth is they're, they're, they're not very educated, or even if they, if they are, their education is mostly in the sciences. When I started getting some education, it, it, everything that I was taught appeared to have been just a complete, remarkable fantasy and lie. Hmm. I mean, um, one of the things I can tell you as a sort of as a matter of testimony is that the majority of kids who shared this view at that time had never read the Quran for themselves. And I remember that one of the teachers used to say that it's a sin to read the Quran directly because the devil will play with your intellect. You have to read it through your teacher, i.e. him. You know, that, that really helps me because in the bit that I know of the Quran and have read of the Quran, it, it strikes me that this is also true of the Christian Bible, you you can't really take every line literally because there's a lot of mm -hmm. contradictory teaching in there or there's a lot of nuance uh, that that, mm -hmm. that has to condition your understanding of the text if you really are taking it seriously. Absolutely. And in fact, one of the things that, you know, started giving me uh, very serious doubts is that there is this sort of uh, effect of, of eradication and destruction of your intellectual capacities. My uh, father would tell me back then, have you noticed that since you've gone on this thing, that your even your vocabulary has deteriorated? So I can't open my mouth without throwing out some type of uh, cliche uh, that everyone uh, in, in, in the mosque who attended these classes would be repeating. In the West, when we look at the root sources of terrorism, we tend to think first of poverty. And, and I have no idea from, from the life you're describing what the economic situation was of you or the people around you. But I'm, I'm not sensing that you feel that that was as much a factor as the life of the mind and how that was oppressed. I absolutely would, would agree with that. I mean, I think poverty does play some role but uh, it is not, in my own, at least in my experience, in my own, uh, my view, uh, 
it was not the main thing. The main thing was the social turmoil and the lack of an intellectual life. Every day you read the, the newspapers the, and the new government-sponsored newspapers, and they all said the same thing. And, you know, the, you turn on the, t- the television and it, there's, there, again, nothing there. There are there, there, no honest, straightforward discussions about anything. You know, basically, it's either how wonderful the government is or it's American movies that entice you with a life that you, will, you can never have. So in, in that atmosphere, the feeling that I remember very distinctly is that I would just feel suffocated. I'd be, right before I started, you know, um, attending the, the, the classes of these guys, day in and day out, I would wake up and go to bed and always I would t- tell my mother and father, you know, what's the point? What's the point of this life? Islamic scholar and law professor Khaled Abu El Fadl. We're talking about the power of religious fundamentalism. At the age of 15, with his father's help, Khaled Abu El Fadl discovered Islamic jurisprudence, a body of Islamic thought that opened his heart and mind. This tradition with ancient roots debates how the Quran might apply to every aspect of life. It is something like the Jewish Talmud. Jurisprudence gave Khaled Abu El Fadl a life-changing alternative to fundamentalism, and he believes that it is the best hope for Islam today, a counterweight to the simplifications used by terrorists. The more I delved into the Islamic jurisprudence and how humble it was, Mm. how these medieval jurists, how remarkably humble they talked, they would never say, uh, uh, G- God's law is. They would always say, in my view, God's law is, and God knows better. Right. I mean, humility is not a term that we would associate with some of these more terrifying images, Islamic images we've had in the last months. Far from it. To me, there was a little bit of even, a, I have to admit, like a post-traumatic reaction as I watched bin Laden speak after 9-11. In the videotape? Yeah, uh, on on the Jazeera channel, you know, I I listen to it in Arabic, of course. And the, you know, the smugness, the arrogance, the the complete obliviousness to the other and the suffering of the other and the pain of the other. At one point, I had a physical reaction where I started feeling my body hurting because at the time that I had informed these um, these guys that I was no longer going to attend their classes. I'm going to attend the class of the real jurists. This is when you were a teenager in Egypt. Yeah, I think I was like 15 at the time. I was beaten quite savagely. And, you know, all the, the, the friendship of, of the past, you know, meant nothing overnight. And just watching bin Laden with his smugness and his arrogance put me back in that scary moment. But... In my case, that beating, and there were several other after that, only sparked the the defiance in me. I vowed and continue to vow never to, to, to shut up and to just stand up to this type of what I consider to be blasphemy against the Islamic tradition and the what I consider to be a very beautiful and humanistic tradition. There's a, a Jewish writer uh, and journalist, Yossi Klein Halevi, who's written a mm-hmm. book about a journey of worshiping with Christians and Muslims in the Holy Land. And he wrote, Islam had a genius for fearlessness. Um, the dark side was the suicide bombers, but he, he also saw a great strength. And, and I mean, that's also a quality that I hear coming through in, in your voice and in your story. I mean, what is the theological root of, of this fearlessness in Islam? Well, you're, you're, you're sort of going to laugh. It's actually, <laughs> it goes back to the uh, theology of jihad. Um, I mean, jihad means to struggle, right? I mean, it doesn't mean a holy war. It means to struggle and to stand for what you believe and to stand with trends and to trust the, your reward at the end for doing uh, 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 what you do is with God. And 
What I am doing, I believe, is jihad. What By writing my books and by lecturing and by speaking out, I believe is jihad. And I believe that if someone decides to kill me because of this, I believe I die as a martyr. Khaled Abu El Fadl is professor of law at UCLA. His books include The Place of Tolerance in Islam. This is Speaking of Faith. When you visit our website, you'll find background on all the ideas mentioned in today's show. You can also sign up for our weekly email newsletter, which includes transcript excerpts and my reflections on each week's program. That's speakingoffaith.org. After a short break, we'll explore Protestant fundamentalism and Jewish extremism through the stories of Christian philosopher Richard Mao and Israeli journalist Yossi Klein Halevi. I'm Krista Tippett. Stay with us. Audio cassettes and transcripts are available by calling 1 800 777 TEXT or by visiting our website at speakingoffaith.org. You're listening to Speaking of Faith from American Public Media. Different theme asking how human experience shapes religious ideas. Today we're exploring the dangers and attraction of religious fundamentalism. What we saw on Tuesday, as terrible as it is, could be minuscule if, in fact, God continues to lift the curtain and allow the enemies of America to give us probably what we deserve. These were the controversial remarks made on national television two days after the September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks by the Reverend Jerry Falwell, pastor of a 22,000-member fundamentalist Baptist church and one of America's most outspoken conservative Christians. I really believe that the pagans and the abortionists and the feminists and the gays and the lesbians who are actively trying to make that an alternative lifestyle, the ACLU, People for the American Way, all of them who tried to secularize America, I point the thing in their face and say, you helped this happen. Authoritative word from God. Uh, You believe that Jesus wasn't just the great human teacher, but that he was God incarnate, the Son of God. Um, that he was born of a virgin, that his death on the cross was a substitutionary atoning death. You know, that, that what happened on the cross uh, somehow brought about, in some mysterious way, it brought about our salvation in a way that nothing else could have done. And uh, it's the belief that uh, he's going to come again, that, that the world has not seen the last of Jesus. Fundamentalists also have an intense interest in Bible prophecy I mean, the the word literal and literalist are really misapplied to fundamentalists because they play around a lot with the symbols of the scriptures, you know, the beast of the book of Revelation. They'll ask the question, who does that stand for? And so they see that as a, a revelation in a kind of coded form that imparts genuine information about things that are going on in our own world. So talk to me about the experiences, you know, the most vivid memories you have of growing up in that kind of context. Well, for one thing, there was a a vast network of of institutions and organizations. Uh, There was, of course, the local church, but we had summer Bible conferences. We had youth organizations like Youth for Christ and Young Life and uh, later on, you know, InterVarsity Christian Fellowship and Campus Crusade. We had evangelistic crusades of the sort that, you know, Billy Graham made very famous, but there were a lot of evangelists that came through town. So it was a, being a fundamentalist was a very busy thing. Uh, <laughs> you, you, you got to do a lot of things. Why? Well, I mean, was there a theological underpinning of that? Well, because fundamentalists were very concerned about conversion, and uh, they, they, they were very open to creating organizations that targeted, that reached out to different groups of people who needed to be converted. And so they uh, placed a, a big emphasis on evangelizing young people. And you get these marvelous, uh, the complex networks of, of organizations. And, uh, and they, they had radio programs. The seminary that I head up was started by Charles E. Fuller, radio evangelist in the 
1930s and 40s and 50s who uh, pioneered in religious broadcasting, uh, one of the first international radio broadcasts. And every week he did his uh, radio program and his wife was there and she read the letters from people. And to this day, I get people who come up to me and say, I can still remember Mrs. Fuller reading the letters on, <laughs> on the radio. And they had these gospel songs. They had wonderful choirs and quartets. In many ways, the, the fundamentalists who uh, were very much against some of the more visible manifestations of popular culture, you've got to remember, these are people who did not go to the movies they did not dance. They did not drink, smoke. They didn't play pool. They didn't play cards. They had all of this list of negatives, and they're very well known for things that they cannot do. And there you can find a lot of common ground with well, Hasidic Judaism and uh, the more fundamentalist kind of Islam. But because they, they didn't go to the movies or they didn't go to dances on Saturday night, they created their own... Uh, rather vital forms of, uh, as it were, religious entertainment. And now Mrs. Fuller is going to read to you from some of the letters if I can find her here in the studio. Where are you, honey? Here, right come on. Here, right here. here. All right, come on. <laughs> well, good evening, friends. Here is a good letter from San Francisco. Dear Mr. Fuller, I was talking to a young man who told me he found the Lord through hearing your message over the radio. While staying home to take care of his brothers and sisters, he would turn on the radio... I'm Krista Tippett, and this is Speaking of Faith. We're talking today about the power of fundamentalism in Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. My guest Richard Mao grew up in a fundamentalist home and is now a Christian philosopher. Richard Mao began to question his fundamentalist upbringing when he became caught up in the political movements of the 1960s. He became a passionate advocate for civil rights, an opponent of the Vietnam War, and an organizer in the radical left-wing SDS while a graduate student. In recent years, he's done a great deal of thinking and writing about what the fundamentalist impulse reveals of human nature and what it has contributed to American culture. And with some irony, he traces those insights directly back to his religious political activism of the 1960s. It was a fascinating experience because I was firmly committed to the anti-war cause and also the civil rights movement, just to take you know two prominent uh, movements of the 60s. And yet, um, one of the things that, that struck me sitting in those endless participatory democracy, anti-war uh, protest discussion groups was that the passion of many of the young radicals was not unlike the passion of fundamentalism. And in my experience, as I left fundamentalism, uh, and I left it behind for um, all the three reasons that I talk about a lot in my book, uh, it was very anti-intellectual, and I could not live with that as I began to study and became interested in the, uh, the intellectual quest, the scholarly life. It was very otherworldly. Uh, fundamentalists were not very interested in doing anything about issues of social justice or peace or, or righteousness in, in the larger world. And the other was a kind of separatistic spirit, uh, a, a, a willingness to uh, refuse to cooperate with any other Christians, even if, if you disagreed with them, even on some minor point of, of doctrine. But, you know, it's very interesting. Uh, in the civil rights movement, uh, hymns were very important to the spirit of that right. movement. We shall overcome. That's right. Mm -hmm. And for me, in many of those situations, uh, as I was struggling, for example, as a, a person in my, uh, my 20s with whether or not uh, I was going to uh, uh, answer the, the draft call and, and uh, be enlisted in the armed forces and possibly go to Vietnam, and I believed, and I still believe, that it was an unjust war, and I could not go, even though I wasn't a pacifist, and I, it looked like maybe I was going to have to go to jail. And uh, people in my family and in my larger fundamentalist evangelical network were very critical of me, and uh, it was a very lonely time uh, for me spiritually and, and religiously because I felt cut off from my, from my roots. But what was interesting was that in all of that civil rights and uh, anti-war stuff, uh, the, the, the things that sustained me were those hymns. <laughs> Even when you did not perceive yourself to be nearly as religious 
Yeah, in those revival meetings, uh, those hymns actually had a very radical scope and a radical tone to them. You know, I surrender all. Mm-hmm. And is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid? And yet, it was it was a very narrow radicalism. Uh, they concentrated on you know your sex life and maybe how you spent your money. Uh, but what struck me and and many of my friends in the 1960s was it was also an important question: Are you willing to yield your racism to the lordship of Jesus Christ? You know, are you willing to be obedient to the gospel uh, even when it goes against what your government asks you to do? Those were very important questions, and it was really the radicalism of those hymns uh, that went well beyond anything that I think the people who sang them, who taught them to me, anything that they intended. But but I took the words, I, I saw myself as taking the words more seriously in some cases than than they did. the passion and the, the, the exhilaration of, of the, those, the civil rights movement and those political movements that you became involved in. And, and I also think when I read your work that there's a real emotionalism to, you know, to a gospel tent meeting that you describe. Is that for you also a defining characteristic of fundamentalism? Yeah, I, I have to say, and I was, I was with a group of uh, well, sort of ex-fundamentalist types recently, and uh, I think I made them a little nervous by saying this. But I said, you know, since those fundamentalist days, I've explored a lot of uh, different strands of Christian spirituality, uh, you know, Benedictine and Franciscan and, uh, uh, you know, the Desert Fathers and the Desert Mothers and, and all these wonderful things, and I've learned so much. But in those moments, in those old revival meetings, when... Uh, the preacher would say, every head bowed and every eye closed, and look into your heart, and are you, do you really love Jesus? For me, those were some of the most sacred moments of my life. Uh, I don't think I ever since then have experienced the transcendence that I experienced. You know, we've talked in these months with regard to Islam, but also in a general way about the root root sources of fundamentalism. And, and I think a positive question in there is what what draws people what is the the human appeal um of fundamentalist religious experience and and I wonder if you could say something about that from a christian perspective you know in our in our so-called postmodern culture there's a, there's a lot of confusion about questions of truth and value morality meaning but there are a lot of folks who just care about how their kids are going to grow up. As I go out into the churches, for example, the, the more conservative, fundamentalist-type churches, I, I meet so many parents who, who have gotten into that just because they wanted someplace they could bring their kids where they would get something about um, uh, a life that has meaning, that has solid values, that uh, promises good things about the future. And fundamentalism, I want to say at its best, fundamentalism gives people uh, some things to rely on, some, some solid foundations. I, I don't think we ought to dismiss that as a, um, a silly thing or uh, some kind of inferior impulses. And for many people, and my own life is an example of this, it was a good place to begin. It just wasn't a good place to end up. But I'll always be grateful for people who, in my earliest days, told me that, uh, that Jesus loved me, that there's a God who's in charge of history, that there's a book that we can turn to to uh, find answers to some of the most basic issues of life. And uh, I've nuanced that. It's gotten a lot more complex for me. But the fundamental way of viewing it is still what I hang on to for dear life. <laughs> 
Richard Mao is president of Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena, California. His books include The Smell of Sawdust, What Evangelicals Can Learn from Their Fundamentalist Heritage. I'm Krista Tippett, and this is Speaking of Faith. We're talking about the power of fundamental... Never find its place with the rest of humanity. In his teens, Yossi Klein Halevi became involved in militant, quasi-terrorist activities of the Jewish Defense League, and he was a leader in a movement called the Student Struggle for Soviet Jewry. In his late 20s, in 1982, Yossi Klein Halevi moved to Israel, which he describes as his spiritual home. Now he is Israeli correspondent for the New Republic and a commentator on Israeli affairs for the Los Angeles Times. He is a committed Zionist, an observant Jew, and at the same time a spiritual seeker and a politically moderate Israeli. He spoke with me from his home in Jerusalem about what his life has taught him of religious fundamentalism's power. To be a fundamentalist means to be wholly immersed not holy, H, <laughs> H-O-L-Y, but quite the opposite, holy, <laughs> to be wholly immersed in your own theology, your own suffering, your own drama, your own historical and theological drama, to the absolute exclusion of any other drama. But the truth is, when I look back on it, it really allowed me to, to turn what otherwise could have been a, an emotionally crippling experience, into a, um, a very vigorous youth. You are part of the chosen people. You're part of, of an, a spiritual elite. You are it. Right. And, and there is nothing more exhilarating than being it. The word intensity yes. recurs a great deal in your memoir. And that word, I think, has a particular appeal f- for young people. You know, not long ago, I, um, I went up to Nazareth in the Galilee, where uh, a group of uh, Muslim fundamentalists are camping out, um, trying to build a mosque that will overshadow the um, Basilica of the Annunciation. And really a, a, a typical fundamentalist move of trying to, um, to overshadow another faith by even just physically building a a bigger religious structure. And were they, they Palestinian? Um, yes, they were mm-hmm. Palestinian. And I went up there and I spent some time with these young people and I was struck by their pleasantness and mm-hmm. it really brought me back to my teenage years, the self-confidence, the, the disdain and among themselves the private jokes being in, in, in a fundamentalist world, it's so funny. I mean, that, that'll sound ludicrous to outsiders. But when you are with your friends, out away from the cameras, there is nothing funnier than sitting around with a group of fundamentalist insiders <laughs> and laughing at the rest of the world. And so much of the fundamentalist's humor is mocking all the jerks outside, and everyone outside your circle is a jerk. Everyone. Talk about that. Talk about how your perception of the humanity of those you are fighting, uh, or perhaps you feel you're defending yourself, but your, your opponents. Um, right. How your understanding of that is, is changed, distorted by fundamentalist thinking. Are they human beings? <laughs> Look, right now, I'm, I'm talking to you from, from a battle zone. Uh, I'm in Jerusalem. We hear ambulances regularly on the road uh, just below where I live. I live at the, uh, the very edge of Jerusalem, literally the last row of houses before the Judean desert and, and the West Bank begins. So I'm, I'm sitting physically on the border, the precise point of the border. <laughs> I feel the war impinging constantly so that my relationship with Muslim fundamentalism is not neutral. It's not, um, it's very hard for me to feel that empathy, which, mm-hmm. which um, in better times I am able to draw on. 
but right now I feel that my my children are on the front lines every time they step outside the door, every time they go on a bus. Um, my daughter, my 16-year-old daughter, was telling me the other day that uh, the first thing she does, she gets on a bus, she immediately sits in the back because she knows that suicide bombers tend to blow themselves up in the center of the bus to, to kill more people. And then she, she scans all the passengers to see who the likely candidates are, whether there's, there's anyone on the bus who might be a suicide bomber. And then when she looks around and she sees everyone looks okay, then she, uh, she'll put on her headphones and listen to her music. Tell me what you understand. Explain to me what's going on in the mind of someone who thinks it's righteous and virtuous to sit in the middle of a bus with a bomb. For the suicide bomber... The victims are abstract. They're not even real people. They're props in an apocalyptic drama in which he is the star. And all of history, all of humanity has been set up for his passion and for his justification. For him to reclaim what he believes is rightfully his to right the wrongs that have been done to him, to his people, to his religion, so that this is an event that is not just sanctioned by God, but has been set up by God as the culminating moment of human experience, the, the, the culminating moment of the purpose of God's creation, which is to right the wrongs, the cosmic wrongs, that have been done. It's to banish evil. And that is what's going through the mind of the fundamentalist terrorist. And that emotion I know very well because uh, although I personally was not involved directly in, in terrorist acts as a teenager, some of my closest friends were people who were planting bombs at Soviet embassies to tried to pressure the Soviet Union at that time to free the Jews, to allow Jewish immigration. And I was intimately involved with those people and tangentially involved with that uh, terrorist world. And the fantasies that I had of, of destroying the enemies of the Jews, they were, they were moments almost of, uh, not almost, they were moments of religious ecstasy. So I wonder if... Something that distinguishes, uh, let's say, positive religious moment from this kind of destructive religious moment is, in fact, the focus of the motivation. Hmm. Right. Something that became clear to me also in reading your work is this um, this tightrope that a religious fundamentalist walks. That in focusing on evil, there is the danger of becoming evil oneself. In in living with a consciousness of enemies, one becomes uh, an enemy. That's a really good point that you're making. And, and that is that when you put darkness, evil, injustice, as the center point of your cosmology, then you risk being co-opted, drawn into, into that darkness. And I think that that was one of the moments for me a revelation of how my obsession with Jewish suffering, with the Holocaust, was, uh, was distorting my, my life and my spiritual life. Former Jewish extremist Yossi Klein Halevi. This is Speaking of Faith, and I'm Krista Tippett. Today we're exploring the power of religious fundamentalism in our world today. After Yossi Klein Halevi turned away from fundamentalism in his 20s, he was deeply influenced by research on people who had suffered catastrophic traumas like the Holocaust or the Soviet gulags. He learned that they survived and created meaningful lives afterward by reaching out to others and drawing on their own deepest spiritual foundations. Eventually, he became profoundly curious about the other religions with which he shares life in Israel. In 2001, he published At the Entrance to the Garden of Eden, a Jew's search for God with Christians and Muslims in the Holy Land. 
Yossi Klein Halevi proposes that only when Jews and Palestinians understand themselves not as victims but as survivors can fundamentalism be diffused. Still, I asked him how the survivor approaches the world so differently from the victim. I think the, the survivor understands that this is, in its very nature, a horrible world, uh, a world of, of unbearable suffering, a world that, I would say, a world where, where the soul really doesn't belong. And what the survivor tries to, to learn from his or her experience is generosity rather than rage. Fundamentalists crave easy answers. The survivor understands that there are no easy answers in this world. And the more you get closer to how God must see this world, the more you're able to take on paradoxes, contradictions. And that forces you into a mode of constant empathy where you force yourself to constantly look at how the world appears to others. And again, you know, in better moments sitting here in, in Israel, in better moments, I, I've been able to at least try to develop that sense of empathy toward the Palestinians, toward the, the Islamic world. It's much easier when you don't feel under constant attack. Right. And, and what I'm so aware of in this journey that you describe with other faiths also is that you recovered precisely the thing that gets lost in the fundamentalist experience, which is the, the humanity. Uh, you know, you wrote about one Muslim Sufi sheikh, suddenly the menacing mass had a benign face. Hmm. Right. Right. I, I, I think that the, the journey that I took into these two faiths was a conscious refutation of, uh, of who I once was. The fundamentalist is ready, in theory at least, to give his or her life for, for their faith. And I felt that my transition from fundamentalist to pluralist wouldn't be complete until I'd managed to draw on that fundamentalist vitality and in some way transmute it and I decided I needed to not just engage Muslims and Christians in dialogue. Right, that's where actually, we always go, isn't it? We go know, to dialogue. No, yeah. no, I, I felt, and here, this is what I learned, <laughs> this is what I learned from the fundamentalists. It's not enough to talk. You have to live it. You have to fully immerse. You have to live your belief to its ultimate moment and enter all of your fears. And, and believe me, there were moments when I was terrified, sitting in a mosque in a Gaza refugee camp, wearing a, a Jewish skull cap, and you really wonder, are you going to get out of the camp alive? What I learned in that very small and limited experiment was that when one approaches another faith with reverence and love, the resistance and the all of the political and theological and psychological barriers that keep us apart, especially in this land, somehow get bypassed. And you're able to get through in a way that is, is, is impossible when the discourse is confined to, to discourse. <laughs> mm -hmm. And to political solutions, I suppose. And That's political right. vocabulary. At this point, I don't believe there is a political solution to this conflict. I think there's so much accumulated rage and resentment and misunderstanding that I personally despair of a political breakthrough. I don't believe that we're, we're anywhere near a spiritual breakthrough either. Although God doesn't need millions of people in order to affect change, where spiritual process differs perhaps from, uh, from the political reality, 
is that it doesn't require masses of people in the same way that political change does. In fact, if you look at the history of religion, any religion, it's the story of a few eccentrics, a few obsessives, who take it upon themselves to make their lives examples of that vision, which, which doesn't yet exist, and allow themselves to become almost entry points through which the divine presence can interact with humanity and change humanity. So the way to resist fundamentalism is not through anger and hatred, because they'll win. You cannot out-hate a fundamentalist. The only way to, to win against fundamentalism is by drawing on those uh, divine qualities that we as human beings are called upon by every faith at its best to emulate. And those are the qualities of an open heart, of empathy, and peace. Yossi Klein Halevi is a contributing editor of The New Republic and the author of At the Entrance to the Garden of Eden, A Jew's Search for God with Christians and Muslims in the Holy Land. Earlier in this hour, you heard Fuller Seminary President Richard Mao and UCLA law professor Khaled Abu El Fadl. For background on all the references in today's program and complete book and music lists, go to our website at speakingoffaith.org. There you can listen to this program again and all of our previous programs. We'd also love to hear your reflections. You can write to us through our website and also sign up for our weekly email newsletter where I offer previews and reflections on each week's program, book recommendations, and transcript excerpts. That's speakingoffaith.org. This program was produced by Brian Newhouse, Marge Strushko, and Mitch Hanley. We had technical help from Tom Mudge and Craig Thorson. Thanks to producer Kate Moose and intern Sarah Dick. The managing producer of Speaking of Faith is Marge Strushko. Our executive producer is Bill Busenberg. And I'm Krista Tippett. Please join us again next week. Speaking of Faith is supported by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Additional support is provided by the Pew Charitable Trusts, sponsoring the Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life to explore how religion shapes ideas and institutions, pewforum.org. The George Family Foundation, funding innovative ideas in integrative medicine, education, and spirituality in everyday life. And the John Templeton Foundation, exploring the creative interface between science and religion. Audio cassettes and transcripts are available by calling one 800 777 text or by visiting our website at speakingoffaith.org. American Public Media.